We'll get this uh, started off. My name is John Pridnia. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, we're very excited to welcome you to the first in a series of webinars that we're hosting in 2021. Our goal with these webinars, all of which are complimentary for you to attend, is to empower you and your business today and in the months to come. 200, or 2020, uh, what a different year. It impacted our businesses, our personal lives in so many different ways. As we get closer to maybe moving away from lockdowns, restrictions, um, yeah, everybody was talking about vaccinations earlier, so everybody gets those and we start looking for more positive changes to the new normal, whatever that new normal is. Uh, our advisors at Raymond are consistently meeting with businesses and individuals like you to review the important aspects uh, in our business and personal lives and ensure that we're not just looking at the cash flows and making sure we're meeting all, complying with all requirements, but more importantly, we're adapting to the new environment that's before us, constantly changing environment. So very important um, to, to have those discussions. And today we're gonna kick off a, uh, uh, the Empowered Planning webinar series by reviewing four key planning ideas. And I want, want to be I remind you that you know business as usual is, is really no longer available. Business is not usual, business is different. So we're gonna to try to keep you up to speed and up to date on various aspects as we go into these webinars here. So today, you see your panelists that are up on the screen. Tony Licavoli will review the employee retention credit uh, to ensure that you've taken advantage of all that is available. Tom Shemansky is gonna review where we are with PPP and discuss key strategies in cash management. Susan West is gonna update you on important HR and workforce matters. And then Ron Nipping will wrap it up with a look at what 2021 in the next few years might look like from a tax perspective, regulations, given all that's going on in Washington these days in the constant changing environment as it relates to taxes. So let's start with what's been available, what's still available, what to look for, um, Tony, I'm going to hand it over to you and start off with uh, uh, the retention credit. All right. Thank you, John. So we're actually going to start off with a polling question. Uh, has your company taken advantage of the employee retention credit for 2020? And while everyone is answering that, I do want to start off with a, a little background on the credit because I think that will go uh, a long way in explaining why all of a sudden the ERC is such a, a popular topic. So the credit itself has been around for over a year, but up until December of 2020, if you'd taken out a PPP loan, you were no longer eligible for the credit. So that basically precluded most businesses from claiming the retention credit. And then now, once uh, December hit, we had another round of stimulus through the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And in that round, Congress both extended the ERC and expanded the credit into 2021. And I think probably the most important thing in that uh, bill, or at least when it, as it pertains to the retention credit, was they removed that PPP loan restriction. And they did it not just for uh, 2021, but they also allowed you to go back into 2020 and claim that credit on wages that you already paid, even if you had taken out a PPP loan. So that really created just a, you know, a ton of opportunities for businesses to look at and amend 2020 payroll tax returns, uh, because it is a, a payroll tax credit, and then claim that credit on wages that they've already paid to their employees. And the, the 2020 credit is up to $5,000 per employee. So if you're looking at a, a small business with, you know, let's use 20 employees in this example, you could still be looking at a six figure credit. So the credit adds up pretty quickly. Again, assuming you qualify and then in 2020, you could be looking at a much higher credit. So just taking a look at the polling results here uh, about well, actually, about only about 30% say they are claiming that retention credit. Um, you know, it looks like uh, about 40% plus have not even looked into it. So uh, hopefully the rest of this section will help help at least get you going on that process. So 
looking at the, the slide up here, uh, we'll spend a, a couple minutes on sort of the basics and how, how the credit actually function and how it works. So it is a it is a refundable payroll tax credit, which that means any excess comes back to you, uh, meaning it's refunded back to you. And for 2020 and 2021, there are much different rules on, on the credits. So for 2020, the max credit is $5,000 per employee for the entire year. Then in 2021, that max credit goes all the way up to $7,000 per employee per quarter. So you're potentially looking at a $28,000 credit per year in 2021 per employee, assuming that you qualify for the entire year. So again, if we look at our, you know, our small business example with 20 employees, again, under 2020 rules, that $5,000 limitation, you could be looking at $100,000 credit, still six figures, still a pretty large amount. But under the 2021 rules, looking at that identical business, if you qualified for the entire year, you could be looking at credits in excess of $500,000. So, you know, a significantly larger number under the 2021 rules. Now, you have to determine that you qualify before claiming that credit and look into the right of that slide, that eligible employer. And to do this, you have to meet one of two tests. Again, we have very different rules for 2020 and 2021. So for 2020, you have to have had a 50% revenue decline in any quarter in 2020 compared to that same quarter in 2019. Or, and emphasize the word or here because you don't need to meet both of these, you've had to have had a full or partial suspension of operations due to a COVID-19 government order. And we'll discuss a bit more over the next couple slides, what it means to have a partial suspension of operations. So for S2020, for 2021, that threshold goes all the way down from 50% to a 20% revenue decline in any quarter in 2021 compared to that quarter in 2019. And then for 2021, you also have the option to use the prior quarter to test to see if you meet that 20% decline in revenue. And like 2020 for 2021, you still have the option of a full or partial suspension of operations due to that COVID-19 government order. But I would say that that test is going to be a bit more difficult to reach in 2021, really depending on your industry uh, because of the loosening of certain lockdown provisions by state by state. So I think a good portion of the businesses that we've seen so far are looking at that 20% revenue decline to determine their eligibility in 2021. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, qualified wages. So qualified wages are limited to $10,000 per employee. You can include both wages paid to the employee as well as healthcare expenses. And for 2020, the credit is much more beneficial if you have a hundred or less employees. And then that threshold goes up to 500 or less employees in 2021. Now, you can claim the credit if you're over this employee count, but you can only claim it on wages paid to employees who are not providing services. You can think of it as you know, furloughed employees or employees that are, let's say, working a 20-hour week, but you're still compensating them for a full 40 hours. So going on to the next slide, uh, let's discuss what steps you should be taking to see if you are an eligible employer for the employee retention credit. And I really just wanna focus on step one on the slide and that is determining your eligibility. So for 2020, you, know, you first want to test your gross receipts to see if you've had a 50% or more decline in any quarter in, compared to 2019. And uh, if you'd taken out a, a second round of PPP funding, you probably would have already pulled these numbers to see if you met the 25% decline that makes you eligible for PPP too. 
Now, if you don't meet that 50% decline in 2020, the, the next step is to determine if you had a partial suspension of operations in 2020. And I want to just emphasize the key word being partial. So, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to the retention credit is that you've had to have been fully shut down or set your operations would have to have been fully shut down during the year to be eligible. And that's just not the case because of the idea of a partial suspension of operations. I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about an example or examples of what a partial suspension of operations can mean, because it can mean a lot of different things. So, for instance, something like capacity limitation. So, you know, let's say you are a, uh, let's say you're a retailer who relies heavily on foot traffic in their locations to generate revenue. So, and when the state imposes, like Michigan did, I think for some point, a 20% capacity restriction on retail outlets you can still meet that definition of a partial suspension, even if you were allowed to remain open for that entire period. You know, partial suspension can also mean things like operation limitations. So, you know, a, a restaurant that, you know, remained open the entire time to do carry out and outdoor dining, even if your sales are steady or even higher than they were in 2019, because of there's been a, a, a huge spike obviously in carry out orders and delivery, you know, you would still potentially meet that definition of a partial suspension. Uh, another common one we see are essential work restrictions. So we've dealt with a lot of contractors, uh, a lot of manufacturers that could only work on projects that were deemed essential for a certain period. So that could qualify the company. Um, also, you know, service industries, businesses that rely on being on customer locations and customer sites or rely on being customer locations to make sales, you know, that could potentially qualify you. Um, you know, anyone in healthcare who could only work on non-elective or emergency type procedures, you know, that could qualify you as well. And, you know, I can go on and on with examples, but, you know, I really think the, the takeaway from this is that, you know, you set up a time, you talk through what the definition of a partial suspension is with your advisor, even, if you think it's unlikely, uh, you know, every, every single business should be having this conversation for the 2020 retention credit. And, you know, John, I know you've been on several calls with me that, you know, how many times have we, you know, been on calls with a company that didn't think they qualified for various reasons, but by the end of our conversation, you know, they, they clearly meet that eligibility because of the partial suspension of operations. Yeah, it's and, key. Right. I, I, in, I think in many of our minds, we look at it and think, boy, I don't think it's going to qualify. We, you know, we, we, we were essential. We were still doing sales. Uh, but lo and behold, get you on the phone and, and there are significant dollar opportunities available with the ERC. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if, if you are, you know, if you're in Michigan, you know, Michigan had very strict COVID restrictions placed on businesses early on. They were one of the uh, most stringent in the nation. So that can help a lot with making a business eligible for the retention credit because we have about 100 different orders from the governor that restrict certain areas of business. So if we can move on to the last slide in the section, I do want to end with a, a few action items, one for 2020 and then one for 2021. And again, I'll just reiterate what I just said, but discuss 2020 eligibility with your advisor to really to determine if you meet one of those two tests. Again, really think about if you had a partial suspension of operations at some point. And then for determining quarter one, 2021 eligibility would be the next action item. You want to compare your gross receipt in Q1 of 2021 to Q1 in 2019, or you can look at Q4 of 2020 to Q4, I'm sorry, Q, yeah, Q4 of 2020 to Q4 of 2019 to see if there is a greater than 20% reduction in your sales. And really, I just say, you know, make sure you do these two items there. Uh, you know, it's, it takes under, you know, I'd say under a half an hour to really address both of these. You know, these, these credits can be very significant and really, you know, any 
you know, any business that qualifies should, should be taking advantage of them. So flipping on to the last slide before I turn it over to Tom, you know, the FFCRA paid sick and family leave, these credits were extended through quarter three of 2021. And I, I know Susan will be touching on them a bit more in her section. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom right now, who's going to give a quick update on the PPP program and then discuss the uh, ever important topic of, of managing your cash flow. So Tom. Thanks, Tony. Uh, just a quick update on uh, the PPP program. Um, you know, it's coming to, you know, kind of towards the end, we've got about a month left. The application for PPP one or PPP loan, PPP two loans is May 31st. So again, if this isn't something that you've pursued or you've been thinking about pursuing, uh, definitely uh, take, take a closer look at it. It's, it's up to a $10 million uh, loan amount uh, for PPP one and two, if you haven't applied. And if you're just looking at a PPP two, it's a $2 million cap. Um, again, with the requirements of a 25% uh, a sales uh, reduction, uh, you know, in, in 20, uh, 2020 or in a quarter versus the last year. So uh, that, that program is, is, is ready to sunset. So, you know, again, good chance to look at it if you haven't. Uh, a lot of people are very interested in the forgiveness side of this program. Again, the big attribute of this program is being able to get 100% forgiveness on the loan. Just a couple updates. One is that the forms have been updated. So if you've been working on a draft or you've been working on kind of getting the information to, together, make sure you've got the most recent uh, forms that came out in mid-January. Uh, one of the big things that if you were on a PPP-1 forgiveness application and had started that, they did eliminate, eliminate the alternate payroll coverage period. So if you had put some numbers together based upon that, you probably need to take a look at it to make sure you don't need to adjust before finalizing your PPP-1 forgiveness application. Uh, and then I also get a lot of questions on timing of the forgiveness. You really have until the end of the promissory note to fill out the actual forgiveness application, uh, but keep in mind that the payments begin 10 months. You have a 10 month grace period at the end of your coverage period. So most people for PPP-1 got their loan in the April, May time period, which meant their coverage period ended around September, October of 2020. You fast forward 10 months, that's gonna put you to about August of this year, where, you know, July, August, where your first payment's gonna be due if you have not obtained full forgiveness. So those are some of the parameters around the, uh, the timing of when you should be looking at it. So we're kind of getting to the point now where you probably wanna be, you wanna get in front of that August uh, or July uh, payment, uh, you probably wanna get to that PPP-1 application uh, process. It's the same form for PPP-1 or PPP-2. So the, the same approach, the same calculations will apply to the second. Again, they did expand some forgiveness cost areas, particularly in that 40% non-payroll. They've included some things like supplier costs, some operating costs. So, so again, if you haven't re-looked really at the changes since the, the, the December bill and the rollout of information in January, I'd take a look at uh, that calculation on forgiveness to make sure you're up to speed. And before we switch into cash, I guess one, one other quick update on the EDL program. Uh, in, in early April, they announced that the EDL loan amount had changed from 150000 to 500000 Again, this is a loan program uh, at a 30-year amortization at a 3-point, I believe it was a 3.75 interest rate for, for pro for-profit businesses. So that, that program changed with, with the December announcement. I think they put $20 billion into that program. So if you got the $150,000 loan initially, there's no need to reapply. You're going to get an email from the SBA asking you if you want to increase from 150 to up to a half a million dollars. The basis of that is 24 weeks of operations to, to see if you can qualify up to that amount. So that is a consideration. Again, another source of potential long-term cash into your business uh, at a reasonable interest rate if, if that's a need for working capital. So, so we're going to transition now into a discussion on cash. So, you know, between ERC uh, PPP and uh, EDL programs, local grants, you know, a lot of dollars have come into businesses and, and they've really been kind of managing that, you know, the short term and you making sure they can make ends meet. But, but now I think really the shift really needs to be is, all right, what, what does the rest of this year look? What does next year look like? And am I well positioned for what the new normal is with my business? And so, you know, really the key to understanding 
both your current and your future cash flow, you know, is information, right? You know, have you revised your business plan? Have you re-looked at uh, your key assumptions? Because what 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 revenue looks like today might be totally different from pre-COVID. So, you know, take a look at your large expenditures, your staffing levels, you know, understand your customers, talk to your key suppliers, find out what they're dealing with. You know, we're seeing a lot of pressure uh, on raw materials, both from a pricing standpoint and an availability standpoint. So sort of understanding that supply chain and, and what impacts it has in your business will really uh, give you clear vision on what, what the future might look like. And at the end of the day, you know, look at putting a cash uh, flow modeling tool in place. Are you using something that's looking just beyond two weeks? You know, something that's more than a balance sheet approach. To, well, hey, you know, here's roughly my income statement projection. Here's my balance sheet and my projected financial cash flow. The timing of everyone's cash flow is much more sophisticated than what your month end balance sheet looks like. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to talk about cash flow modeling a bit. And really a 13 week rolling cash flow model is kind of a kind of a standard tool that a lot of companies are moving towards to to give them that dynamic planning tool. Um, you know, and really the benefits of this is that really it forces you as an organization to just think longer term. You know, what 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 is our customer and our supplier uh, needs for our business going to be, you know, more than just over the next two, four, six, eight weeks, but into the 12, 14, 20 week time frame. You know, for it forces the organization to be more integrated from a planning standpoint. It's just not an accounting exercise. You really need to get sales involved, purchasing involved. Uh, so it really drives engagement in the business and, and it kind of really can provide that kind of focus, that rally call to say, hey, what do we need to do to make sure that our cash flow is, is under control, that we clearly know where we're going, and if new projects come in, where our pain points might be, especially if we're in the project space where, we, where our cash flow is very lumpy, we have progressive payments and things like that. So, so that's a little bit, if we talk a little bit more specifically on the next slide, we'll look at, you know, what is a 13-week cash flow model? Uh, you know, what does the process look like a little bit? And so, I think you know it's 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 important to understand that it's it's not a, just a traditional financial uh, cash flow statement. It's 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 a modeling tool. It's something that's based with formulas, either in a spreadsheet or a piece, you know, some software. Uh, you know, the banking industry really looks at it as the standard when they're you know they're looking and analyzing cash flow. Um, but it really, what it does is it combines actuals and forecasts together into one place, so we have a really good understanding of are we going to run into trouble with our cash balance, our line of credit, our line of credit availability. Maybe that's formula based that we need to understand inventory and our AR balances. So we kind of marry up, we take our aging, you know, we know that our accounts receivable and our accounts payable aging is, is, is pretty concrete information. We can forecast that out. But then what we're doing is we're taking that next step. We're looking at sales pipelines, open, open sales orders. We're looking at our plan purchases. We're using our MRP system to leverage information about the future, maybe our historical averages. But we're starting to integrate this planning information with our current information to really understand where is our cash flow heading over the next 12 to 20 weeks. You know, we're going to analyze our staffing levels, our payroll dollars, you know, our spending. And, 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 and the thing is, is this is a, a, a living document. It's up, you, know, you update it on a regular basis. You roll it forward. You analyze your results and you try to learn from it. So it's really a tool that is really essential in this dynamic environment that we're in. So, you know, if you don't have something like this, you know, now's a good time to say, hey, what would it take to get something like this running in our company? So uh, next slide, just as a couple couple points that really talk about, you know, what are some of the things I should be considering that maybe don't jump up to, you know, front of mind, you know, but there's things like, um, you know, progressive payments, the timing of payments. I, I find that a lot of businesses, they sometimes struggle of really understanding their cash conversion cycle. How long do they have to pay their labor before they get paid? How long do they have to bring material in before a project does their initial billing or the progressive billing? So all these timing things uh, on projects or, or if you're in a repetitive environment, you know, when you need to bring a truckload of material in a steel or resin or things like that, or you need to hire a bunch of people for a new project, that's all upfront cash that we need to work into our cash plan and make sure that, you know, we're kind of understanding. So, so I think, you know, it's just, uh, you know, with, 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 you know, we don't know what the next, if there is a next set of stimulus or what that might look like. Um, but we're just at a point where, 
you know, I think there's going to be a pause as, 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 as everyone assesses where we're at. So it's important to stretch the dollars that we have now as long as we can stretch them. And having a tool like this can, uh, can really help. So it's, it's something that, uh, again, you should be talking to your advisors about and, and understanding. It's like, it's, hey, can we do more uh, in, in a cash flow uh, management standpoint than what we're doing today and just get some, some different ideas of, of how to take the next steps there? So. So I think uh, at this point, I'm gonna we're gonna transition into the HR section, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Susan West. Ah, thank you, Tom. Well, folks, uh, we are looking at how complicated and complex this pandemic has been, and how it's integrated into almost all areas of uh, our workforce. Um, so we want to talk about what are the seven areas that you need to be keeping a focus on to reduce your risk. Um, making sure we're still complying with the multi-state, county and local orders, um, updating your preparedness and response plan, any of your COVID policies. We're gonna be talking about COBRA today. We're also gonna be talking about unemployment, um, talking some about your vaccine strategies and updating your policies. Uh, Michigan's extended the in-person work, prohibiting in-person work for any positions that can be done remotely. So what does that mean? And how do you really maybe look at those people who are gonna to continue to be in remote work and really defining um, that in a formal policy? And then we also wanna talk about um, you know, FFCRA, the leaves, how that also relates to FMLA for extended need. And we're finding now that there's a lot of personal travel. So we recommending that employers look at how do you address travel in your policies and disclosing, having employees disclose, disclose their travel plans. Are they international? What are any quarantine policies you're recommending? Are you recommending any testing before they return to the office? having all of that documented and then making sure you handle that consistently. And then lastly at the bottom there about how do you continue to communicate? How do you continue to look at engagement? We know Gallup reported a 10 year low last summer in engagement and it's slowly trickling back up, but we're learning now how to manage that engagement process in, in a much, um, uh, a, a social distancing environment and a remote work environment. So uh, how do we stay atop of all of that? First of all, we want to talk about unemployment. So <clears throat> there was an extension um, of the uh, PUA through September 6th, and uh, that extended the $300 a week for those that were qualified. Um, we also saw the extension of the benefit weeks from 24 to 48. And obviously that is for all of those folks that may be qualified. Now, there was some confusion in the sense that Michigan um, has the extended benefits under the normal UIA, and that actually ended because of our lower unemployment rate for the last three months, April 17th. So it's really understanding um, how all of these play together for any employees that you might have on under unemployment and making sure that you're responding timely to any notices. We're still learning that there's a lot of fraudulent activity and application and making sure that you stay on top of that um, to ensure that your employees are, are notified if you as the employer receive any of those notices and you're responding timely. Under COBRA, there was a um, a change in the American Rescue Plan Act that allowed for um, a federal subsidy from 85% to 100% through September 30th. And there is a special open enrollment period that started April 1. We really want you to work with your third party administrator if you have one, such as Health, health Equity, for example, to make sure they're following um, and executing on these processes. And now the, the DOL notices, model notices have been published. We have a link here. So please make sure that if you're handling that on your, on, on your own within your team that you are 
giving that subsidy to eligible employees. The next area is under the um, Family First uh, FCCRA leaves, and those have been extended through September 30th. Now, effective January 1, employers could uh, choose to offer that on a voluntary basis. It was no more, no longer mandatory. And now that's been extent, extended through September 30th. It did reset effective April 1, the 10 day paid sick leave. So if somebody had used eight hours previously, 80 hours previously for a COVID related eligible reason that now has been reset and that same employee could use those 80 hours again. We want you to please ensure that you're still requesting the proper documentation to confirm the eligibility of your employees and that your a consistent practice is held in making it available to all employees. The very bottom bullet there talks about the act actually declared that there's a non-discrimination rule and possible denial of the tax credit if the leave offerings are favoring employees on the basis of a full-time status, highly compensated or tenured employees. So once again, if you are an employer offering this, um, please make sure that you're clear about all the employees that may be eligible and that you're you know, doing the kind of documentation and discussion with those employees, that interactive process to ensure that they are in fact eligible. We're finding that there are unique situations that are arising. Um, so for example, uh, if an employee tests positive for COVID-19 and they're asymptomatic, you know, what happens and how do you handle that? So again, you get the guidance from your, the medical providers. You don't demand that the employee come back, even though they're asymptomatic. You need to be following the proper processes and making sure that you're following the guidelines that that healthcare provider has identified. So it's interesting the kind of situations that are showing up. As it relates to these voluntary uh, leave credits and uh, eligibility, we're finding that state and local um, local communities have their own ordinances. So. If you could move to the next slide, please, you'll see that um, not all, all these states have identified state laws. So for example, in Michigan, we have the Michigan paid leave law, which many of us have incorporated right into our vacation or PTO policies. But there are other states, um, for example, New York that has a very specific paid leave law that not only allows for um, payment due to COVID, but also to um, family, paid family leave. And that could take not only your eight weeks, for example, for a pregnancy, but extended another additional 12 weeks for this paid leave law. So employers are really, if you're multi-state, have to really pay attention. Um, Philadelphia, for example, um, and Pittsburgh have their own local, uh, paid leave laws. California has seven cities that have paid leave laws. New Jersey has some. So how do you, uh, if you're multi-state, please make sure that you're recognizing how all these leaves and whether they're paid or not um, are integrated into your policies. Now our biggest conversation that we're having with our clients is around vaccinations and the impact of those who are getting it and those who are not. 33% um, of Americans believe that COVID-19 vaccination should be mandatory. And that 28% of Americans who have been employed at some time point in the pandemic would not get vaccinated, um, even if it meant risking termination of their job. So there's still a huge, um, rift or huge uh, vortex created in the workplace around this. Employers are struggling. What is their vaccination strategy? And so if you look at the next slide, we have this, this dynamic of do we recommend it or do we require it? Right now, many employers are, unless they're in the healthcare field, 
um, are choosing to recommend it and they're taking active communication and discussion surveys with employees to understand what's the state of their employee base and um, how are their employees reacting to uh, getting their vaccine or not. So what's interesting, even if it's required in the healthcare scenario, only 7% plan to mandate vaccines for employees returning to work. So that's an interesting dynamic. And then on the recommend side, 60% um, of the organizations say that will not require it. What we're finding, however, is that our clients are experiencing questions around from their customers to say, we're not going to allow your employee on our site unless they're vaccinated. So now what do you do as that employer that has an employee who has a job description that includes their work being done um, with interface with a customer, and now they're not able to go because they're not vaccinated themselves. So a lot of interesting dilemmas are coming up and custom, our, our clients and employers are having to sort through all these details. So why aren't the employees getting vaccinated? There's a, um, a study done here by um, SHRM, the Society for Human Resources Management, that sort of outlined all the different reasons. I think education and continued awareness is going to continue to um, help educate our employees. But I, we're in this process for the long haul. And I think um, clients are just going to have to continue to figure out their communication strategies on this and um, actually put together a policy. So if you look at the next slide, here are some of the reasons for looking at a pro-vaccine, sort of that requirement, and some of the things to consider uh, versus the recommended um, or personal choice kind of approach. And <clears throat> one of the topics that have come up around this is do we incentivize our employees to go get the vaccine? And that has uh, been talked about in terms of different studies. And Sherm again did a study that said 11% of employed Americans say they would consider getting their vaccine if their employer offered up to $150 and 21% would consider getting the vaccine if offered uh, 150. So it's interesting, there is guidelines right now that uh, you can get paid while you go get the vaccine, obviously under the leaves and also um, it's a tax credit that's available. So I really think that this whole conversation is going to continue for a while and employers need to be prepared to handle all the different dilemmas that are coming up as a result of it. And I want to really take close with the overall workplace safety. Um, 80% of businesses report that they have a formal in, informal business continuity place and plan in place. So this is your uh, COVID-19 pandemic response plan. 27% of workers report they haven't been told anything about the or, how the organization is reacting. This really highlights a big, big disconnect and being diligent about continuing to educate and reinforce your COVID-19 um, workplace protections and actions becomes critical. Why is that important? Well, we're seeing an increase in activity um, by my OSHA here in Michigan with random surprise visits. And one of our clients who's in the manufacturing um, area, she's the CFO, she shared that they had a random surprise visit by OSHA. And she was so thankful that we had, had assisted her with her HR rapid response plan with both the, the resources and the tools and the consulting services. And she said that they asked questions around seeing the, their actual response plan, the written document. They asked about the daily screening process that they used and the documentation. They reviewed specific COVID workplace exposure cases, what actions did they take? What documentation did they have? How did they respond? 
they actually interviewed employees. And when they interviewed the employees, they spoke to them independently, separately, and they asked questions like, how did the company respond to a COVID exposure? Who do you go to with COVID questions? How are COVID related decisions made? Who is your COVID coordinator? So Myosha is very, very much in action, making sure employers are um, putting their workplace safety requirements in place. And what we found was the main reasons for my OSHA in initiating a fine was a lack of the preparedness and response plan, failing to train employees, a lack of social distancing, a lack of face coverings, the fact that the employees were not maintaining the six feet of social um, distancing, not removing an employee from the workplace suspected of having COVID-19, not doing the daily screenings, and uh, not contacting the health department when they did have a positive COVID exposure in the workplace. So in closure, it's just reminding employees of their shared responsibility to maintaining a self safe and healthy workplace is um, important to all of us. And our due diligence in making sure our practices are in place are gonna protect us all. It doesn't end. <laughs> Back to you, well, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Appreciate that. Such valuable information, such important information for the protection of our people. Um, and the, you know, staying out of the, I'll say out of the news and out of the penalties and fines areas, you definitely got both very important things covered. Thank you so much. Ron, I'm going to pass it over to you and talk about planning. Um, uh, this is going to definitely be a year again of change. And uh, I think planning is most important. So take it away. I'm actually going to start off, John, with a, oh, a little bit start. on some of the, the, okay. the business tax side. So uh, we're going to end with the uh, some of the more recent items that have come out in terms of President Biden's tax policy and tax plan. Uh, you know, we are at the very early stages of this process. So, you know, we don't believe that anything is immediate or imminent, but it's definitely something that needs to be factored into not only business planning, but obviously tax planning as well. So before I turn it over to Ron, I'm going to focus and talk a little bit about the corporate tax changes that have been proposed to help fund uh, both infrastructure as well as many of the other uh, priorities of the Democratic Party. And then again, Ron is going to talk about the individual side um, and more specifically uh, estate planning and, and capital gains tax planning. So, you know, the, now that these items have come out and a lot of the items that have come out over the past month heavily focus again on the, the corporate side of taxation. So not necessarily your, your flow through such as your, your partnerships or your S corps, you know, those will be addressed indirectly through the Biden individual tax proposals. And the other area of interest uh, on top of corporate taxation has been uh, U S companies with foreign operations. So the, the proposals on this slide, you know, mostly echo what President Biden had said during the campaign. I don't think there's too many surprises on here. Uh, the first one is raising that corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%. Uh, this was a, you know, a, um, you know, a pillar of his, his, his corporate tax proposals uh, during the campaign. You know, again, we may not end up going all the way up to 28%. Uh, this would end up putting the U.S. back in the top uh, corporate tax rate in terms of developed nations when you combine our state and local taxes as well. But I, I think we can end up or expect seeing something like uh, a 25 percent corporate tax uh, getting support from moderates. So then the, the second bullet point on there, the increase in funding for the IRS and more enforcement initiatives. You know, this is definitely going to happen. You know, the, the current IRS commissioner, I think, really understands the, the political side of things and has definitely made some statements over the past month that I think were probably intended to grab headlines, I think maybe regardless of, of how much merit they had. And I, I think we're going to end up 
seen a much better funded, much more aggressive IRS emerge over the next couple of years. And then the third bullet point, uh, you know, your energy credits uh, are going to be expanded. And, and when I say energy, I'm really talking about green energy credits. Um, you know, these are going to be they're part of the overall infrastructure plan. And I think the, the tax incentives are going to be part of any bill that gets proposed down the road. Or well, I guess at least at least any bill that gets proposed by the Democratic Party down the road. Then the last bullet point on there, this is you know creating a 15% minimum tax on your book or your financial statement income, but only for companies with $2 billion or more in net income. So this will act as a new minimum tax for these largest corporations. But again, they wouldn't directly affect the majority of businesses in the U.S. To, due to that $2 billion threshold. And that, again, is on income and not revenue. And then if we can flip on to the, the next slide, you know, the remaining items on the list are really focused on foreign operations and really focused on preventing U.S. companies from shifting profits over, overseas to lower tax jurisdictions. So you know, there's been a lot of talk about establishing a global minimum tax through the use of uh, multilateral negotiations. So through the use of an organization such as the OECD. And one way to do this would be that first bullet point, which would be to deny deductions to corporations on payments that they make that would allow them to strip profits out of the US. If those payments are being made to a country that does not agree to adopt a global minimum tax rate. And for this to be effective, you would obviously need a significant amount of countries to go ahead and agree to this rule. So that's where the, the aspect of the, the multilateral agreements would come into place. So you couldn't really do this effectively at a country by country negotiation. Uh, second bullet point on there, preventing corporate inversion. Now, this has been a pretty hot topic over the past, I'd say, 10 years. So under current U.S. law, and I'm going to you know, grossly over, oversimplify this, but you know, a corporation, a U.S. corporation can acquire or can merge with a foreign company in order to limit its U.S. taxes. Even, you know, even in the end, if its primary place of management and its primary place of operations still remain in the United States. So the, the Biden proposal would aim to continue to treat these companies as U.S. entities. So basically, they would still subject these foreign companies to U.S. taxation. And this would be based on where they are truly being managed from. Last two bullet points, uh, proposed changes uh, to some newer TCJA provisions that passed in 2017, guilty and FDII. Uh, don't want to get into detail on these, but these were put into place to discuss some of the issues we just talked about, profit shifting overseas. Uh, but the, the current administration does not believe these to be effective. So there could be some changes coming to these two provisions. So uh, a lot of potential changes on the corporate side. Again, these are mostly targeted at large multinational U.S. corporations. Uh, so, again, especially with those with uh, foreign operations that they believe are, are shifting profits overseas. So I'm going to turn it over to Ron now, who's going to be covering, uh, some, at least covering some of the individual proposals and especially those related to your state and your capital gain tax planning. So, Ron. Hey, thank you, Tony. We spent the first part of this seminar talking about how we can get funds from the government for our companies. This part is really about how the government's going to get money from us to fund the, those grants and programs. Uh, in late March, there were two bills that were introduced to Congress, uh, both having to do with a state plan. At first glance, it might not seem that way, but they really are two sides of the same coin, because both acts that have been proposed are aimed to increase tax revenue for the federal government at the death of somebody or the transfer or gift of an asset. Uh, for the 99.5% Act, uh, it's going to increase these revenues to the government through the estate tax, basically lowering exemptions, raising rates, eliminating or hampering tools used in estate planning. 
The STEP Act, on the other hand, is more like a stealth estate tax, being that it leverages the capital gains tax rate by uh, put, uh, putting capital, capital gains by treating the death or gift of an asset from somebody as a sale. So you'd have to pay capital gains tax at that point. And if you've been watching the news, there's a lot going on about what the tax capital gains tax rate is going to be with President Biden and his speech tomorrow. But let's go through some of the details. 99.5% um, Act. Uh, we said the exemptions are going to be reduced and the gift tax is going to be decoupled from the gift. Uh, basically, the exemptions are going to go from 11 and change down to three with a million for lifetime gifts. And as normally would happen, these are going to be effective if the bill passes at the end of the year, this year. This brings a little bit of a wrinkle into it. We've been used to being able to give X amount of dollars to each recipient on an unlimited basis each year without getting into the gift and estate tax exemption. This bill would limit the annual gifts to 10,000 per participant for a total of $20,000. So you can give 10 grand to two people. Uh, this change would be effective on the date of enactment. This is where it gets kind of uh, impactful. Uh, Right now, if your state as an individual is 11.7 million, you're good. Uh, the rates below may seem egregious to some people, but it really is getting closer to where it was uh, not more than a decade and a half ago. But where it becomes real important is when you're getting to the larger dollar amounts, those percentages we haven't seen in a long time. Key here, uh, effective December 31, 2021, at least gives people the opportunity to do some planning. Next. Part of the acts that we have not seen before is basically taking the majority of tools used in estate planning off the board. Uh, elimination of valuation discounts on transfers to family members. That's often used in uh, closely held businesses, family LLCs, and family limited partnerships. Again, the change is effective date of enactment, so there's still some things you might be able to do. Okay, next. Now here's where it gets real interesting. Many, many families have used grants over the years to try to transfer assets to the younger generations without too much in taxes. Uh, the changes seen in the first two bullets effectively defeat the grant strategy for passing wealth to younger generations. And the change here is also the date of enactment. Next. Now, idgets. The good part here is if you have an intentionally defective grant or trust in existence now, it should be grandfathered in. And this also includes things like ILITs, life insurance trusts. There will probably be changes that are trust, that you make to a trust after enactment that would implicate the transfers. But overall, this isn't that bad if you already have an idiot. If you don't, it's, you're not gonna be able to have one. Next. Now the dynasty trusts used by uh, families to basically keep wealth in the family over long periods of time. The government's gonna say 50 years is now a long period of time. And you're either gonna have for new trust, dynasty trust, a 50 year term, or for old trust, it's 50 years from when they were enacted. And then they're subject to significant gifting. Again, at the date of enactment. Now for the STEP Act, this is a stealth one. Basically what they're doing is since People can now hold an asset, have it appreciate. When you pass on, the next generation gets a stepped up in tax basis. The government wants to charge a capital gains tax on that appreciation. Next slide. Basically right now, like you said, everybody gets a step up in cost basis. It's one of the biggest advantages of the current estate tax law. Us thinking that's an advantage of the estate tax law, when it's seen from the other side, they actually say this is the biggest giveaway in the estate tax scenario, being that they look at the money they're not getting because that asset never had capital gains go against it. They want that money now, and this is what they're gonna be doing. Your first million dollars of asset appreciation is not included in this, but after this, anytime someone dies or you gift an asset to a family member or a trust, it's gonna be treated as a sale. When at the sale, at the treated sale, capital gains taxes will be incurred. Next, please. Again, 
uh, working through this. Some of the trust issues, uh, what it says require large trusts to record items such as the trustees, grantors, beneficiaries, balance sheet and income statement to the IRS. The IRS version or this bill's version of a large trust is a million dollars or $20,000 of income each year. Now they still let you ex exempt up to half a million dollars on unrecognized gain of your personal residence. I guess they wanted to throw that one in there just so there was some benefit. Next, please. This is the uh, really surprising one. Notice the date of effectiveness. It already happened. This would be a retroactive test. Tax. Next, please. Now, who should be thinking about this? If you see yourself as one of these profiles on this slide, please reach out to your Raymond advisory team and start the planning and process. Like Tony said, we don't know what's gonna be in the final bill. These are proposals right now, but the themes won't change. There's gonna be increased taxes. There's gonna be changes to the rule. The need for planning is real. Start the conversations early because if we can address the themes with you, once the law gets passed, we'll have at least the hard part done and then we can help you navigate through the law for your family's best interest. So thank you. I will pass this back to John and questions. All right, thank you, Tony and uh, Ron, on, on uh, getting us teed up for what might be looking at us uh, as we enter the rest of 21. And, and uh, most importantly, as you said, Ron, you better start planning now uh, and getting ready for it. Uh, going back to Tom's comments on cash flow, taxes are a big cash flow item uh, on the outgoing side. And so you need to plan for those accordingly as well. So thank you for all the panelists. We have a, a couple of minutes for a questions. Tony, I'm going to ask, ask you to unmute. And there were two, uh, I think maybe two or three questions that really dealt with ERTC timing. So, and I think it's different based on whether you use it for an amended 941 for 20 or use it in the 21. Could you comment on that? Uh, How long does it take so, to get your refunds? Ah, gotcha. Okay. So that's a good question. Uh, we don't actually know the answer to that. Uh, you know, I think the the highest estimates we've seen from payroll companies are six months. We have had clients that have filed back in February and have not received the refund. Uh, you know, you can call the IRS and see if they've processed the 941X. Uh, chances are you will not get a satisfying answer. Uh, so we kind of are stuck at, you know, at the mercy of how fast the IRS is going to be able to process these. One more question for you. Does a partial suspension of operations also allow eligibility in 2021 for the ERC as well, or just the 20% decrease in gross receipts? Uh, the partial suspension is available for 2021. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to meet because a lot of, a lot of restrictions on businesses have been um, removed in certain jurisdictions. Uh, but, you know, you can definitely see it as being applicable to restaurants and, and gyms, entertainment venues, any place like that. So, yes, it is available. Good. Well, thanks again, panelists. We're wrapping up at the top of the hour. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is the first of our series in 2021. We hope you continue to join us throughout the year. Look for your emails as they come in. The recording and the slides will be coming your way shortly. I think there's been a couple of links to the slide deck and the recording will come um, in an email later. Um, and do not hesitate to reach out to any of your Raymond advisors. Uh, clearly, we are here to help you. We're help you, here to help you navigate through this year and into the future. So please reach out and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Have a great day.